rain, and then the cool pursed lips of the wind draw them from the ground, red and yellow skulls pummeling upwards through leaves, through grasses, through sand, astonishing in their suddenness, their quietude, their wetness. They appear on fall mornings, some bounce on the earth on one hook, packed with poison. <laughs> Others billowing chunkily and delicious. Those who know go out to gather, choosing the benign from blocks of glitterers, sorcerers, rustulants, panther caps, shark white death angels in their torn veils looking innocent as sugar, but full of paralysis. To eat is to stagger down as fast as the mushrooms themselves when they are done being perfect and overnight slide back under the shining fields of rain. That's Mushrooms by Mary Oliver. Welcome. Well, I'm, I'm delighted to be here and uh, to share with you some of the, not only fungus that is among us, but the wild foods out right outside our door. And, um, and we're going to meet some of those uh, live and fresh, and some of them dry are going around. And did they make it back? No, I guess that's a good sign. Okay, they made it to the pack table. All right, great. Well, hopefully we'll use all our senses tonight uh, somehow, because I'm used to being outside. I teach in Asheville, North Carolina, where I take people out to eat outside. <laughs> and uh, we do that every Saturday. I have six guides now, but I've been doing it about 20 years. And I haven't lost a customer yet. Uh, and that includes um, people going to over 100 restaurants that my company has been supplying a few hundred pounds a year. And um, you could do the same. <laughs> and hopefully some of you are inspired to do that. Um, you are here for the Wild Foods Lecture, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, let's get started. This is what we're going to learn tonight. <laughs> and. Um, we're going to start by um, scaring you. <laughs> this is the kind of thing my, um, my mom likes to send me. In fact, I think she literally <laughs> cut those out. <laughs> you know, my, my, my whole family thought I was crazy to do this when I first started out. And only once I got on television did they take me seriously. <laughs> um, because it's just about the craziest thing you could do, right, in, in this culture is to go out and eat, like, not just wild food, but wild mushrooms. You know? Has anyone here done that before? Eaten of wild mushrooms? Okay. Everyone else, look around. See? They're still around. <laughs> so this is my niche market. We live in a fungophobic culture. And um, that's uniquely you know, Anglo-Saxon. So we inherit that from England. But are the people who did or didn't raise their hands, do they, do they have any relatives or grandparents who used to do that? My grandmother. Yeah. And she lived to be like in her late 80s. Then she, she poisoned me. <laughs> <laughs> I thought she was scrambling eggs one morning. It was cow's brain. So I don't know. She had a lot of weird stuff. Oh, you're wrong. Cow's brain. Nice. Any other bizarre food experiences I should know about? <laughs> Last week I had a woman, she, she literally told me she ate a deadly mushroom and survived. And I had her come up front and testify. <laughs> but, you know. Hopefully by the end of this evening, you'll be uh, in just the right place, 50% between really excited to eat wild food and a little bit terrified to do so. Because that's where you want to be, right? In between. Something reasonable. No one else has grandparents or family that used to do this, huh? Yeah? That's right. I had a revaluation once. I don't know if I'll have time to pass those out, but it said, would you take a, another course with this instructor? And they wrote, yes, if he continues to live. <laughs> that was a long time ago. Um, all right, what's next? Yeah, um, this is the, the release form that um, Stanford Nature Center had people sign so that I could teach them how to pick and eat wild mushrooms. You see where it says... We do not recommend eating wild mushroom. <laughs> um, so I got a, a, quite a kick out of that. And I haven't heard any complaints from anyone there. So does that look familiar? Mm -hmm. That was uh, 
approximately, what, four hours ago? Um, and I was flying in here. So I, I, the plane lands, and I text my mom and say, just don't worry, I flew to DC on 9-11, I'm OK. And this was on the TV, all right? And um, I, sw I swear, two seconds later, after I passed that with my luggage, somebody's bag comes sliding down the escalator, like all the way down the escalator, and bang, and lands right in front of me, and I have to move out of the way. And I'm just laughing to think, okay, that thing's going to blow up. <laughs> That's going to be too much of a coincidence. <laughs> and then the guy got down there. He's, oh, I'm sorry, sorry, I lost. You know, it was one of those things on wheels. And so that was my welcome to Washington, <laughs> D.C. And, and then I go through, no, this was before, right? Because I, let me think. Yeah, before I got on the plane, I brought my tool, which is called a bright. So you're going to have to imagine what was on the other end of this, taped together with this neon tape. Oh, no. All right, half brush, half knife. Now this is like a little like kid knife. I mean, I thought it was dull, you know, super dull, and they would let me uh, take it, but no, too dangerous. So um, this is the not just fungophobic culture or biophobic culture, but just phobic culture. You know that we live in. We live in a in a, a culture of fear. And um, what does that create? It creates a situation where I, this is my friend Michelle. There she is back there. <laughs> Say hi. She drove me here so you could thank her afterward. And uh, as we stopped for lunch. We got out of the car. That's her car in the back, right the back of that bumper. And here's the mushroom that was right, uh, you know, in that tree. So I'm going to pass that around, a piece of it. Take a whiff of this. And, um, you know, I have a guarantee when I teach that if you have to go more than 20 feet to find a wild food, then you get your money back. Yeah. <laughs> And someone asked, are we going to get out and get dirty? And I, I gave a lecture last week, and I did, I did just drag everyone outside. I went for about an hour, and I'm like, people are like, have you gotten enough of this? And I said, yeah. So we all just went outside. And um, let's see, am I up to the, no, we're not quite there yet. I want to show you what will happen if we do step outside, because I took a picture right outside the door to show you something. But before that, we got back in the car, and I am going to tell you what this is in just a minute. But I want to tell you what happened next. So we're driving over here. You can see it says Washington, D.C. What's this road? That's right. That's right. That's right. And I said, well, we couldn't slam on the brakes. I have a bumper sticker on the back of my car. that says, I brake for mushrooms. Well, unfortunately, we couldn't brake. She had to go to the pull-off and let me off. And I ran back uh, barefoot on the highway. And luckily, didn't get arrested because I managed to make, make it out of there. Yes. Oh, that's so I do have something fresh to show you. And can this make it it's all the way around in one piece? I don't want I know, I've never been invited back. She says it's against the law, but I just did. Well, I don't know. Maybe I won't pass it around. Maybe I won't pass it around. But you can come up and out of it at the end. Anyone know what this is? That's right. What is it? Tell them. Is it edible? Two people said it. Is it edible, edible and incredible? You got to speak up if you want to be. <laughs> that's, that's right. You have to have put spots if you want to be a mushroom hunter. So you got to speak up. And hen of the woods is close, but no cigar. Chicken of the woods. We're going to meet hen of the woods later on. It's a little bit early for hen of the woods. And those are two different things, and you'll see pictures of them. And this is part of the problem with names. You can get them confused, right? But if you never forget a face, if you see it over and over, believe me, you won't get these confused when we is, see the photo. Is it a type of fungus that looks like a sacrifice? Or, no? Uh-oh. You're, <laughs> you're going to scare everyone away with those big words. So fomies is a mushroom that I believe they found on Otzi the Iceman up in the Italian Alps after he was mortally wounded and, and died 5,300 years ago. Now, it was not from eating a mushroom, but this is not the mushroom he was carrying. It's not a foamies. This is Labiaporus, also known as sulfur shelf or chicken of the woods. Chicken of the woods in my top 10 to learn because it's all over and because you might be driving down the street and cause an accident. It's so common. <laughs> or if we back up, 
This mushroom, looking very much like that, was featured in the New York Times. If you look up, I believe it's called the disturbing mushroom of Lincoln Place. Because it came up underneath like a sidewalk, bubbling up like that. And all the comments, you know, are really entertaining. You know, most of the people are like, well, it's a monster, that's disgusting. So to introduce that mushroom, and we'll come back to it in a minute with some more attractive photos. Does anyone know what that one's called? That's right. R-E-I-S-H-I. And Reishi is known in China as the mushroom of immortality. Okay? So eventually, about 50 comments down, somebody identified the thing and told them, well, you know, that mushroom is actually like highly prized in most of Asia for the medicinal value. You know what it's called in this country? White butt rot. <laughs> butt rot. Not your butt, the tree's butt, B-U-T-T, -T, because it recycles trees. It recycles trees? Uh-huh, yeah, this mushroom will grow on, on dead trees. Well, see this tree, oh, this wasn't see. dead yet. And the inside of a tree is, and a mushroom could hollow out a tree and cause the tree to fall, because the inside you know, of those rings is no longer alive. So that's nature's premier recycling system right there. Any questions about those two? Yes. Is the chicken of the woods an edible? Well, you know, normally I would have my cooking gear on me if, if I didn't fly, <laughs> and I would have cooked it up and had you decide for yourself. But in lieu of that... Well, it's called chicken, so I assume it tastes like chicken. Yeah, that's right. Well, I was on the History Channel, and they, they served it to a bunch of people who didn't know it wasn't really chicken, and they fooled everybody. Okay, so um, it's aptly named, and if you have children who usually don't like mushy, slimy mushrooms, this is the one mushroom they'll eat. Can you eat it raw? No, you don't want to eat mushrooms in general raw because they're indigestible raw. They're not made of cellulose, which would give you fiber. They're made of chitin, which is what the exoskeleton of insects and Lobsters, and all arthropods. In it. So if you eat your mushroom raw, it's like eating all you can eat seafood in the shell, and not soft shell. So believe it or not, as soft as it is, it doesn't melt in your stomach from your stomach acid unless it's cold, or unless you're one of the very small percentage of the people who have what's called uh, chitinase, just like lactase dissolves lactose. Chitinase dissolves chitin. And unfortunately, unless you're eating it all the time, you don't have that in your system. It's back to you. So you can't count on, on that. All right, question back here. Is chicken in the woods grown commercially? Yes, with some difficulty. Um, so it's not the easiest thing to grow, or I, I would see it more often, and I would make far less than the $16 to $25 a pound that I do get from it. Um, all right, so, does that look familiar? Yeah. Where, where have you seen that before? Out front. Yeah. Right, out front. And so, so I am, I, I might raise sort of the eyebrows or the ire of the establishment that just like <laughs> hired me because this is going to be a, the contrast I'm going to place to what we're talking about today. And we're talking about weeds. And so, you've seen that? That was also outside. It's right off front. Mm -hmm. At the end, you'll pass this. And so it says, why are there weeds? And we have a common scar scourge. How do you scourge, right? Um, a plant out of place. In agriculture, weeds compete with crop plants, et cetera, et cetera. can have a devastating effect. And so they have a bunch of weeds out there. Do you know what the definition of a weed is? Anything. That's right. It's something that grows where you don't want it. So if, uh, if the grain was in my yard, it would be a weed, <laughs> right? See, I pull the grass out so the dandelion can thrive, except the dandelion doesn't need my help, okay? You all know, you don't pull weeds, they take over, you see? So the idea of permaculture, which is what I'm proposing, is not to fight nature, but to grow what naturally grows there already, go with the flow, right? That's not what agriculture does. So the, those amber waves of grain are 
Well, let me back up and ask you, like, do you know what, I'm making it easy for you, do you know what the most destructive thing humans have ever done to the planet is? Not fertilizer, it's not pomegranate, is that what you said? Plowing. Plowing, any other guesses? Livestock, Livestock huh? Monocrops. Monocropping, no? You're all close. That's, that's the answer I'm looking for. Just clearing fields. We live in, in the East Coast, you know, obviously, where when the settlers got here, a squirrel could go up and down the East Coast without not ever touching the ground. It was so densely covered in trees. That's natural. Not fields. Even in the Midwest, where you have prairies, prairies is an ecosystem you have to get rid of in order to plant field amber waves of grain. It's not natural. That's why it's been a struggle for 5,000 years to grow food for ourselves. That's why we have famine. Agriculture isn't easier. It's actually harder than hunting and gathering, which is what you're learning to do today. I didn't have to do anything to raise this. I remember this spring I went to yoga class and the woman was like, now I know you all are getting out in your garden and you're going to hurt your back carrying stuff now and you've got to be careful because you're not used to moving. And I have to laugh because to get exercise, I need to go help my friends with their garden. Because I don't have to go very far to find wild foods. It's easy. Here's an example. You recognize that? Morels. Morels. So this is going to be the first of the dozen things that I'll show you. The only ones you need to know in order to feed yourself hundreds of pounds a year without even trying. I found these two just walking around. Not even in the woods. There's more wild food in the city than there is in the woods. You'll see in a minute, we're going to see some pictures of that. Morels are one exception. They can come up in the city, but um, this is my secret location that will not, I will not disclose <laughs> at the moment. But um, I sent this picture to my mom, and what do you think she noticed? She said that shirt is not very encouraging. <laughs> it's all what you focus on. This was two years ago. <clears throat> Not every year is this big a year for morels. But when it is, you put it up and it lasts you several years. And if you don't get enough morels, you, you hunt other things. <laughs> but um, when you do get morels, you are, you are rolling in not just food, but money. That's, that's worth an awful lot right there. In fact, I did a dinner. This was uh, relatively cheap, I think $125 dinner. Mm -hmm. Well, good eye. Can you name the greens? There's a, there's a movie called Play Again, and it's about what we call now nature deficit disorder. And I don't think that's in the, what is it called, DSM-4 uh, psychology manual yet, but this is a problem with children. Now, she recognized the wine, but not the greens. And at the beginning of this documentary, they show kids' slideshow. They put the double arches, and they, oh, yeah, McDonald's. And then they put like the peace looking thing, oh yeah, yeah, be, uh, Mercedes. Then they put a dandelion, and the kids are like, uh, flower? <laughs> That's the state of our alienation with this agriculture that we've been in 5,000 years. Is it a leaf? A leaf. It is a wild leaf called ramps. And it's been dehydrated, you know, to be um, translucent and to stand up straight, this fancy dinner. And that awful looking black mass is the morels you saw in the last slide. Um, but they're better, they're better cooking than looking. There's a quote by uh, Anthony Robbins about them. He compares them to, um, well, I can't say it in this audience, but, you know, that's suggestive maybe of what I'm to, where I'm getting. So you, not just humans love morels. <laughs> And you've got to be careful because we always have competition. That was my old house. And um, this was my old arch nemesis. <laughs> but um, I, I now take people. It's my same spot just this year. Uh, I take people to it. And I have to get much more out of sharing it, you know, about a dozen times with people who each bring home a handful than going in there and just cleaning out, you know, and making less money selling. So that's why I don't do that anymore. I just teach and it... It feels more rewarding. And it's a lesson about mushroom hunting. For many years, you think the mushroom hunter is about like being secretive and having your own place, right? And 
just getting your, your stuff and selling it. It actually doesn't work well. I don't know why. Because to be a good mushroom hunter, more important than where is when. So these morels, I may know where to go, but that's a 45 minute trip and I don't know when to go. You see? But this is in, basically in someone's backyard. I mean, that's somebody's woods. In fact, one time I had to sneak away because I heard him coming. <laughs> but the smarter thing is, if I made friends with that guy, and I told him, look, I know you walk through these woods, you walk your dog all the time. Tell me when those mushrooms come out, and I will get you dinner for two for a restaurant for free. That could be worth like $75, but you know how much the morels are worth? Like 750 So you cooperate. And we'll see a really vivid example of that coming up. And that's it for the first of our dozen denizens of the delectable set. Any, any questions on more else? All right, onward. What does that look like? Like cherries, like goji berries. Good call. Currants. Cur no, not currants. I'm not positive you have this here. Maybe one of you knows. It's Eliagnus, also known as autumn olive berry. Yeah, uh -huh. you have to. That's right, the birds. <laughs> exactly. An invasive exotic. Do you know what else is an invasive exotic? White people. <laughs> um, right, but uh, if you can't beat it, eat it. And the Billmore State spends uh, where I live, and I'm like the official mushroom hunter for the Billmore State, and I have to dodge the uh, bulldozers taking out hundreds of these trees a year. Meanwhile, yesterday, just yesterday, I was out with the James Beard, best chef of the Southeast, and we were picking as much of this as we can. And she's going to use it in a guest street with, um, I don't know, like a roast lamb or something like that. What's her name? Ashley Christensen. The name of the beard? No. The name of the chef. <laughs> yeah, and that, that's a good reminder. Don't try to learn anything tonight. <laughs> I see some of you taking notes. When you go out with me, you get a list of all the names. Okay? And don't try to memorize names. And the comparison is, and it's a little ironic because we're not outside, but when I teach, I compare it to an immersion. Isn't that the best way to learn a foreign language? Like, you just learn from practice. You don't try. Like kids learn three, four, can learn three languages you know, at once. Kids are great at learning wild foods. It just comes naturally. So if you're struggling at the end of this, you know, on that scale from like terrified to encouraged, you're more closer to this end. It may be because you're trying to remember all these details. I went up with Bob Mollenbrock, and he, he went through 250 plants and there was like no way we could remember all that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. impossible. You don't have to. Yeah. You know, but part of sort of uh, becoming aware of things is also becoming aware of how the environment interacts with those things. The birds and the animals and the rest of it. So, you know, you're aware of those indicators now. So what, what kind of things you're looking for in the environment that are giving you clues? Not a proof, but a clues. Yeah. Um, well, the morels, I knew for many years, would be under tulip poplar, okay? Because they're associated with that tree. That's where you aim for it. You could literally spot tulip poplars a mile away. They're the first bright green leaves coming out. So they say, find the tree, find the mushroom. Well, what I didn't realize until my morel hunter veteran friend came from Missouri is that every tree I thought was a poplar was actually an ash. And the ash, <laughs> even better than the poplar. So if you know a little bit, you go for poplar and it doesn't help you too much. But then if you go for ash, we were, we were getting 30% like occurrence rate of a morels under every, pop, every ash tree that we found in this one spot. That's amazing um, for something that, unlike chicken of the woods, is pretty hard to find. So you look for habitat. This is all a system, and I'll say more about that. But uh, overall, don't try too hard. Don't try to remember too much tonight or you'll get overwhelmed. Just have fun. That's what we were having when we were picking these. Um, so very simple. That's autumn olive. And people ask me, well, how in the world can you tell 
You know, I always heard, don't eat the red berries, you know? And, and, and people say, well, how on earth like, can you tell that from you know, a poisonous berry or deadly mushroom from an edible one? And I say to them, well, how can you tell cabbage from iceberg lettuce? How many people learn that in school? Nobody, right? You, you never picked up a book? Did your parents ever sit you down to show you the differences? This is what I'm getting at, right? So if the deadly mushroom was in the store next to the edible one, and the iceberg lettuce and the cabbage were next to them, and you grew up with both, you'd be able to tell right away. Okay, it's just a matter of what you pay attention to, just like that, that wine you were talking about. I can't even name it. What, did, what was it called? I just know it's a ball back. Yeah. The, like, See, I'm not a wine expert because I haven't focused on that. Some of you will walk out today, you'll be able to name all the cars that go down the road because that's what matters to you. So just pay attention, and those differences become apparent. I had an Asian friend, and I said to her, hey, Joanne, how come you don't confuse each other? And she said, hey, you know, all you, all you white people look the same to us. <laughs> you know? It's just what differences are you used to looking at? Do uh, you recognize that? What does that look like? Does it look like anything you've seen today or before? Huh? A spaceship, yeah. Uh huh. Let me show you another picture. Does those look familiar? You think those are the same or different from the one before it? See, this is because you don't have experience. After experience, you begin to tell whether some things are the same or different. Does that look the same or different from the other two? Now, notice that some of these have the white and yellow and some have the red. You know why? Because she just said it. It's a different age. Right. So this is the problem that some of you are going to ask at some point, well, what books do you recommend? I actually recommend that you get rid of every book you have. <laughs> okay? It's a very easy way to not learn your wild foods. Because if the book has one picture of the mushroom at a particular age, Imagine taking me taking a picture of you at age five versus fifty-five. You're gonna look different. All those are the same, same mushroom. And you know what? They're the same as this. Reishi. So, reishi or lingshi in China, uh, and that reishi would be the Japanese name. Um, so after a while, you could step out of a car and you recognize what that is. Yeah. These mushrooms like this are seen before and seen in Oriental. Stores, but how do you how do you fix these really firm, hard kind of mushrooms? Mm -hmm. All right. How do you use them? Yeah, how do you use them? Because when I've seen them, it's like I can't believe this thing is edible. That's right. It's actually you look this up in one of those books. You know what they'll say? Inedible. I'm telling you, it's a medicinal mushroom. How can a medicinal thing be inedible? Do you soak it in strain or something? Well, this is inedible too. Does everyone smell the root beer root. You don't see this floating around in your root beer because they strain it out. Same with this. Not for flavor, but for medicine, you're going to get what's called heavyweight polysaccharides if you simmer it and you just throw the mushroom away. Easily water-soluble medicinal component that is highly cancer-protective and curative. So this mushroom, which here is called white butt rot, you know, is worth a fortune where people realize what it's good for. One of the... Um Mushroom vendors at our farmer's market sell a mushroom tincture that has that reishi in it yeah. and a couple others. Uh -huh. And have you bought it? Mm -hmm. Have you taken it? Mm -hmm. How many years have you been taking it? It hasn't been a year yet. It's been okay. months. Well, I've only been taking, remember, it's called the mush, did I tell you the mushroom of immortality? Mm -hmm. so anyway, I've only been taking about 300 years. So I don't know if you're <laughs> right. Just check back with me. <laughs> And that's what you have to do. And for all the medicine here, these are tonics. Just like taking exercise tonifies your muscles, right? Mm -hmm. You can't just go to the gym and, and you know, bench press 500 pounds and leave. It's something that you gradually do. It's a lifestyle. So you take this every day. And uh, it will build your immunity. How hmm? much is too much if it's medicinal? 
It's, it's very difficult to take too much. You have to take uh, 10 times, 10 to like 30 times the dosage, which is like 5 to 15 grams a day, what's recommended. So you would take this, you'd dry it, it would lose 60% of its weight. This might weigh, uh, I'm no expert, I mean, quarter, it's a quarter pound, um, maybe dried, uh, so that's about, uh, you know, 150 grams, that much. That would last you 10 days at maximum dosage, dried. So, um, and it does the effect, right? No, not dry. They're very stable, these compounds. And you don't have to tincture them. So we think tincture for medicine or pills, it doesn't work as well. Right, herbalist back there? All right, you can ask them afterwards. If we break on time, my friends are in an acupuncture program. They use a lot of herbs. And um, yeah, another thing, our food has been taken from us and sold back to us and our medicine. It's sad. Sassafras is declared carcinogenic by the Food and Drug Administration. You know why? Because they took 10,000 times the amount you could possibly ever have in a drink and injected it into a mouse. Okay? A six-pack of Miller Lite is more carcinogenic than this, but that's not illegal. So there's a big difference between what's traditional and where we've come to. And uh, traditional isn't difficult. Remember, I told you all you have to do is simmer this, and all you need for 15 days is this much. You see that? That is 100 pounds dry. Okay? That is a third of what this guy picked with his daughter in one season. He picked 750 pounds fresh of this mushroom. So if you want to prevent what, look around the room, one out of three men and two out of three women is getting in this, in this lifetime, you take that. I'm talking about cancer. It's an epidemic. Yeah? So how do you know when you're over-harvesting? Um, when you're shopping in the store. Okay? Foraging doesn't hurt the woods. Not foraging is what hurts the woods. Because you're buying your stuff in the store. And by stuff, I mean, in this case, food. And our food comes from agriculture. And agriculture is the most destructive thing humans have ever done to the planet. And it's documented. Uh, I mean, there's no, in, in the latest, well, issue before this one of National Geographic, it's called The Future of Food. They show a diagram I could pull up for you. You know, 35% of the land mass, you know, of the earth that was forested is gone for agriculture. Not monocropping, you know, not for Monsanto, not for some major corporation. 70% of that is subsistence farming. You know, it's just peasants, you know, cutting down the rainforest, for example, so they can grow, what do we eat? Corn, grain, soy, things that are not only worse for the environment, worse for us to eat. And stuff isn't good for you, it just keeps you alive. See that guy? He's living on reishi. <laughs> and you don't have to, you know, nobody asks you how this tastes. Yeah, it's bitter. Um, but, you know, so is coffee and chocolate. And I have a James Beard, you know, two nights ago, I, I did a James Beard dinner with um, a confectioner who's, who's making chocolates with reishi. And um, it goes surprisingly well, but, you know, the interesting thing is that not every medicine is bitter. You recognize this mushroom? Huh? It's the same thing. That's right. That's right. Same thing. But young. And when it's young, it's fat and it's juicy and it's soft, just like this chicken of the woods. And you can slice off that white part. It's not bitter and it cooks up like steak. Very strong and mommy flavor. It's just amazing. And I sell that for $75 a pound because you can only get so much for a very short window. This was too late. That's going to be bitter. Um, and this is the wrong uh, species anyway for that. But not only medicinal, but gourmet at the same time. So people will go to great lengths to find it. <laughs> and if you come out foraging with me, I'll take you to this very spot. They actually filmed Last of the Mohicans up here. And I filmed a couple TV shows you could see on my website um, up there. That's Walker Falls, for those of you who have been to Asheville. And um, if you come at the right time, meaning in June, this is my acupuncturist friend who lectures an entire day workshop on that one mushroom. That's how medicinal this is, Reishi. 
people come, we have 40 people wanting to know everything you could possibly know about it, and Jessica teaches them. <coughs> this is another acupuncturist who came and uh, was just delighted. If you look at old uh, Chinese artwork, you see that scroll pattern all over the place. Nobody realizes that that's an abstraction of the reishi mushroom. So there's a real thing. Like a turkey? Mm -hmm. And we're going to see another mushroom, just as medicinal, called turkey tails. Um, also great for cancer. So I mentioned, you know, medicine, food, and art. This is a close relative to the reishi. If you turn it upside down, on that one called the artist conch, it's white, and you can scratch uh, drawings into it. You can even sort of do it with this one. Oh, I'm not being very careful about it. But by tomorrow, that'll, that'll dry, and the etch work won't scratch anymore. It'll just uh, set itself. And this is an etching, not a drawing. It's from scratching the surface. The artist conch, that one's called. Back, oh my, do you recognize that person? She's sitting back there. <laughs> so um, anyone see this before? Let's look at some more pictures. That's right. Did you hear that? It's an Asian dogwood, often called um, you know, Korean dogwood, or kuza, which is the word for Korean in Japanese. Don't try to remember these words. I wish I had these. I picked a basket full of these, and they're in my fridge, and hopefully they'll keep for when I get back. This is one of my favorite fruits, and it's not technically wild, not in our area. It doesn't naturalize and thrive on its own. See, that's the food that I really emphasize that people grow. This is used in landscaping. In fact, this is the U.S., uh, I'm sorry, North Carolina Arboretum, and this is about two minutes before my friend and I were threatened with arrest. That's right, it, because in any state park, and stuff, you, you cannot even take rotting fruit on the ground. Only leave your yeah, and um, I was going to like refuse to relinquish you know, my, um, you know, my birthright, but my friend leaned over to us with me that time, and she said, Alan, I have a meeting at 2. I don't have time to be arrested. <laughs> So we dropped the stuff where it, where it, where it landed. And um, I wish I had more to give you. I've served it on uh, Bizarre Foods, and you can watch that video. And Andrew Zimmern said it tastes like black plum, but I, think, I say it tastes like flan or creme brulee or custard. Yeah, you think so? Um, yeah, I love it. And there it is. Hey, Michelle, I think that's the day we went out. Yeah, so Michelle apprenticed me. You could actually do that. Um, and that's how you learn. You go out with someone over and over again. That is the traditional way, you know, not to put people in boxes you know, we call schools and separate them from, you know, a real upbringing. This is wild grape. Concord grapes, this is what it comes from. A unique American grape called fox grape. Not very different from the cultivated one. And um, in that corner, you recognize that? Just starting. Hmm? Well, that's a mushroom, that, the white thing, but yes, persimmon. Is below it. Wild persimmon is small. Yeah. And full of seeds. So they're not worth bothering with? No, the fruit is delicious. Okay, good. You just you're just spared my uh, you know, wrath. Because people will say stuff like, oh, it's full of seeds, it's you know, too much trouble. And, you know, I'm excited. I'm going to go. I can't believe I'm here ne right by the CNO Canal at the beginning of pawpaw season. Because we don't have many pawpaws in Asheville. But we're going to spend uh, Saturday just driving all the way out to Berkeley Springs, if we even make it, from all the pawpaws that I'm excited to fill the car to the roof with. <laughs> Y'all ever, anyone had pawpaw before? OK. I bet some of you are like, oh, it's nasty. Or you really got to get it. It's just the, you love it, right? Some people are, you may have had one that's too ripe, and they're like, oh, this is bad. This is the thing about foraging. Yeah, sure, you have to know what, what to do and how to get it. This isn't like McDonald's french fries. Like, they're always exactly the same. It's a little more complicated. This is why the, you know, the number one restaurant in the world, you know what it is? Noma. Last four years. Noma. In Copenhagen, you know why it's number one? What does it specialize in? Forage. Forage food. Every meal's different, you know? 
I just read a review. They served a bowl of wild strawberries. They didn't do anything to it. They just served you wild strawberries. I wonder how much that person had to pay. <laughs> yeah. Can you do anything with Papa's seeds? Like, are they... You didn't make a necklace? <laughs> no, they may actually be toxic. I'm not sure. I think I know you can do insecticide with the uh, skin. If you ever get a zinginess on the skin, I think that's what it's from. Uh, yeah, so when I say something's edible, particularly with plants, you need to know what part of the plant. Now, the seed of persimmon is usable. You can roast that. You grind it, roast it, and make coffee. Very tasty coffee. Very difficult to roast, to uh, grind. Very hard. But it's quite nice. Yeah, so it all depends. And um, foragers can't be choosers. <laughs> so here I went out and found five different things. But same day the following year, it could be five different things. Could be nothing. But every day you get, you get closer to the day you get your windfall. You know? it's, it's, a, it's a spiritual practice in non-attachment. There's the nothing day. <laughs> all right. Some days, you can't reach what you find. <laughs> hey, you recognize that? Yes. You do? Not everyone, right? We'll keep looking. Do you recognize that? There you go. See? This one didn't take very long to learn. Have you ever seen these before? No. First time you've ever seen it, she's already recognizing it. Okay? Some things are harder than others, but just start with this. How much this, what does this weigh? Um, at least five pounds. Okay, 15 to pound, $75. Like, I didn't even go out of my way to get it. Okay? Um, and, you know, I really would love to give everybody a piece of this, but I'm teaching on, in Rock Creek Park on Sunday. And in case we don't find mushrooms, I want to have something to show folks. And you're all welcome to come, except that time you're going to have to pay for it. <laughs> it's uh, three hours from two to five. If you want to go out and find this stuff in the field, and then you, get, and you really get to keep it, and come on out, and uh, you just look on the website, and you can sign up. Okay, that, that's what I love to do. That's where we go out, and we actually see from start to finish how you find these things. Isn't that gorgeous? It broke my heart to sell that. I wish I had it, but you know, it, you can't preserve that. It, it, if I dried it, it would shrivel up. Uh, someone wrote me, sent me uh, this photo, and um, said, "I don't know what this is." Um, I said, I can tell you what it is. Uh, you know, it's an edible a mushroom. Do you want it? He said, no. I picked it up, got on the, pulled over the car in 30 seconds, got on the phone to one chef, sold it for $150, uh, brought it five minutes away, and drove off the money. So you all are probably not, like, living hand to mouth, or you wouldn't be coming in here. You know, but the guy who panhandled us, you know, about two hours ago, probably wouldn't have to be doing that if he knew how to hunt wild mushrooms. And I'm going to meet with a guy at the USDA, uh, one of the senior councils or something, on Monday. And I'm going to propose, why don't we make foraging taught in public school across the country as a basic skill? You know, how many times do you, do you really use math, you know? Um, <laughs> Imagine kids, like, after school, instead of getting on the video game, like, going out and foraging for their families, you know? I could have been the, a kid who saw this sitting in the back seat, told mom and dad to stop, and gets, like, $75, you know? So they can buy a Game Boy with it. <laughs> this is not unusual, okay? This is a small chicken of the woods. And um, remember the guy who pointed out the ash trees? That's him. He started when he was six years old, okay? What is he, like 20-something now? This guy does mushroom hunting full-time. That's all he does for a living in Asheville. He was afraid to leave Missouri. He didn't know if he'd find enough mushrooms. I said, yeah, come to Asheville. I think you'll be okay. <laughs> he came. It was a terrible first year. I felt so bad. But this year, he was just bumping. And he thanks me. I could pull up the text from him on here every day for, for telling him to come to Asheville. These people, this guy's an artist. He doesn't have to be hunting, but they are beside themselves with something they found. Oh, that doesn't blow up too well, does it? It's a very old picture from like 95 when I first moved to Asheville and got started. Is that chicken in the woods? Is it just another burrow? Yes and no. It's another polypore, it's called. It's related. This is Berkeley's polypore. Bandar Zawea Berkeley eye. 
I only say that to show off. Don't try to remember that. <laughs> All right? It's edible when young. And it could be young and that big, but usually by that time that big, it's that big, it's uh, tough like it. Tough and acrid. What makes a great centerpiece. <laughs> oh, this is a card my girlfriend wrote me. Um, and it just, I think it is instructive that, you know, once again, like, if I put you in a lineup, and I haven't known any of you before, except for my friends over there, I may not recognize you, if the police do, and you just, like, came through my house at 4 a.m., you know, and I just caught a glimpse of you walking off with my TV set. But if it's one of my friends, then, you know, sure enough, they're familiar. So it's just practice. And practice, you know, a little knowledge goes a long way. This is my neighbor's house. May 21st, 2010. That's my birthday. On my birthday, I passed this. You know how many pounds that is? This is what it looks like. Just the first batch in the back of my car. I think I have that in my iPad. Yeah? Like right now? Yeah. Um, someone have a pen? I live close by. All right. Okay. Here you go. Give me your phone number. You get a free visit from the mushroom man. I will take that back to the lab and tell you. Yeah. What is the tree that's supporting that? Ah, it's an oak tree. And remember what I said about what happens when a mushroom is on your tree? All right, so let me tell you what happened here. I sold that mushroom, guess for how much? Okay. How much? More. No, more. Well, not a head, but the entire amount. Less than, if you go over, it's like Price is Right. If you go over, it's, uh, so. A thousand. Yeah. yeah, you're getting closer. $750. So I picked one batch. I went back to get more. And I hadn't asked the first time. And I'm struggling, you know. You know, really, I, maybe I should ask, but I was afraid he was going to say no. I was like, oh, he's not going to miss these mushrooms. So I'm back there. This time I'm with my friend. My friend teaches like relationship and communication skills. He's like, Alan, Alan, I really think you should ask. Well, I hadn't decided. I get out of the car. I'm walking towards the next batch. The guy comes out of his house at the same time. And he's walking towards me. Of course, like, why am I walking through his yard? Well, I have to, I have to explain to him. So I was like, you know, hey, can I? You mind if I pick this mushroom? Now, get, mind you, like, I'm afraid that he knows someone already picked it without asking. I'm afraid he's going to say, oh, you must be the guy who took the first one. Well, he didn't even realize that the second batch, is that what's, oh, I wish I could get a preview. Oh, yeah. That the second batch was not the same as the first. He, he didn't care. And you know what? Not only did he not mind, he helped me gather it and bring it to my car. That's it. That's 2010. Flash forward 2011, I'm like, okay, that mushroom's going to come back. I know. And here it is coming back. I'm really excited. Okay. Now, Remember what I told you about what happens to mushrooms uh, my, that are on a tree when there's a chicken in the woods. A housemate comes home. He goes, Alan, did you see what happened to that house? I'm like, no. It had been raining for like three days. He said, oh, you really got to go see this house. I'm like, okay, okay, no, I, whatever. I was on the computer. And uh, the next day, I finally have to go out. I drive by the house. And the house looked like that. This tree had fallen, crushed the house. And a branch this thick had come like within six feet at 3 a.m. of this guy's bed. Could have killed him. I felt so bad I did not warn him. Now, I didn't think of it. I didn't think it through. And now I realize it. So this is what I could have done. I could have realized it. I said, hey, listen, cut your tree off, you know, at five or six feet high, okay? That's what's left of the mushroom coming out. That was a huge amount under the ground. Another, who knows, 750 or more dollars. Cut that thing off, save your house, and you know what? That mushroom would have kept coming. But it kept eating the whole dead tree, all the root system for like 10 years. It's about $7,500. I could have given him 10% of that. He would have been happy. That's what happens. You don't cooperate. You know? It was a real lesson for me. And it happened. It inspired me to create this whole, this whole thing about teaching everyone how to forage and being more communal about it. Um, well, uh, this is... Uh, um, Christy Hefner, Hugh Hefner's daughter, the Playboy uh, CEO. And uh, I do take people on, oh, that's me in the background, teach them. 
And I didn't teach her for free, granted. But we're fixing up uh, wild foods. And the funny thing about it is, you know, people say to me, oh, you know, you can't teach hungry, poor people to eat this. They're not going to eat this stuff. Are you crazy? But I say, no, they won't. But they'll sell it to people like her who will pay for it. And then they'll make plenty of money to buy food. Ugh, what is that? Beets? No. Black walnuts. Anyone want to complain about black walnuts? Do you have these here? Oh, yeah. Anyone have them in their yard? Make this kind of awful mess? Right. Have you ever eaten the awful mess? Yes. How is it? I don't like them. No. How, do you, how have you had them? Just straight? They're brownies. They're great brownies. That's right. Ice yeah. cream. Oh, yeah? You didn't like it in the ice cream? And they stain your hands black? Yeah, yeah. Well, so, of course, everyone has their opinions, but um, black walnut ice cream, third most popular flavor in a lot of regions of the U.S. Um, 30 million pounds of this are gathered of this awful-looking stuff.